America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We shall never surrender. Welcome to the War Kitchen, where we showcase the foods and recipes that sustained nations during times of conflict and food uncertainty. Few people on Earth have experienced complete and utter starvation like the participants of the Battle of Stalingrad. All sides, the Germans, the Soviets, and the citizenry of Stalingrad all suffered extreme starvation and malnourishment during the winter campaign of 1942-43. We will cover the latter two groups in due time, but today we are going to discuss an extremely easy to make and nutritious recipe that the German military relied on for decades. Erbswurst. Literally translated as pea sausage, Erbswurst is really just a simple pea soup that is compressed and formed into a sausage shape for easy transport by the usually overburdened soldier. Erbswurst was a critical part of the iron ration which consisted of Erbswurst, a tin of canned meat, and some variety of hard tack cracker. When needed, this emergency ration could easily be broken up into a mess tin of hot water and consumed as a nutrient-rich soup when no other food was available. So what did this recipe contain? The main ingredient that we will have to work with in this recipe is obviously green peas. We prefer the dried variety because it makes everything easier later. Next up is some kind of pork. Historically, this was pork belly or whatever pork meat was available that was high in fat. Fats provide a key part of emergency rations and in this case, the fat will help this ration stick together. In our case, we prefer to use bacon because it's usually cheaper and usually easier to find pretty much everywhere in the United States, even in times of hardship. It also doesn't really matter what quality of bacon that you use, if all you can find is the less desirable options, it will work just fine. And technically that's all you need. You can make a crude Erbsverse from just these two ingredients. However, it will taste much better with a few spices if you have them. A great thing to add to this is onions. Historically, fresh onions have been a great option due to their cheap cost and very powerful flavor. So if you have fresh onions that you can dice up, that would be preferred. But you can also use dried onion flakes or onion powder if that's all you have access to. Additional spices to add include things like salt, pepper, thyme, or any other spices that you might like. 
Really the sky is the limit for this kind of ration, so feel free to add what you like. Just remember that you can always add in spices, but you can't exactly take them back out again. So if you want to experiment, it might be a good idea to do so in small batches, so that you don't accidentally ruin the entire recipe if something doesn't work out. After all, this ration is meant to be a low-cost, nutritious food, so wasting a lot of it kind of goes against the theme of why this recipe is important. The actual preparation of this recipe is great for not letting anything go to waste. To prepare this pea soup, there are quite a few methods, all of which have their merits. So if you want to follow these steps out of order, or have a slightly easier way of doing it, by all means, experiment. The first thing that we like to start with is turning those dried peas into a pea flour. Now you see why dried peas are preferable. If you can't find dried peas, but normal canned peas are available, you can use them, but you will need to dry them in a food dehydrator or an oven. Canned peas contain a lot of moisture, which won't result in a nice shelf-stable product in the end, so dried peas are usually best for this. Once you have your dried peas, you can throw them in a blender or a food processor to turn them into a pea flour. Remember, this is primarily an emergency ration, and in the production process, we're going for as little resources required as possible. And electrical appliances aren't exactly disaster proof. But fear not, in a pinch you can grind up the peas with a small mortar and pestle if that's all you have. Once you have your peas all ground up, the next step is to cook the bacon. We prefer to cook the bacon in a rather large pot as opposed to a normal frying pan. This will make sense in just a moment. Then, in order to not waste valuable cooking fuel, you can throw in your freshly chopped onions if you choose to add them. Cooking the onions in the bacon grease along with the bacon will impart a good flavor and keep the pan hot for the final step later. You will want the onions to be as finely chopped as possible. This ensures that they cook very quickly, again conserving fuel. And it also makes it easier to rehydrate when the soup is made later. If you happen to use a particularly lean batch of bacon, uh, what you might find is that you don't have enough bacon grease to make all of this stick together. You're, you're going to need quite a significant amount of fat. So, what you might end up having to do is use bacon grease from a previous batch of uh, bacon that you cooked. This is why it's important to always save the bacon grease when you cook a batch of bacon, because bacon grease is a very valuable uh, culinary tool uh, for other things besides just herbs first. And that's exactly what we ended up doing on this recipe. We ended up using about a quarter of a cup of actual baking grease from another batch of bacon that we cooked previously so that we could add that to the bacon and onion mixture this time and so that it can actually start softening up and uh, liquefying again for the next and final step. Once your fat's all melted and your bacon and onions are all done and you've added in your spices, you can add in your pea flour. Stirring all of this together, you should have a pea soup paste that's about the consistency of cookie dough, or maybe even peanut butter. The amount of pea flour that you actually add to the bacon and onion mixture will vary widely depending on what kind of bacon you have and how much uh, bacon grease you put in. This recipe highlights a common theme throughout most historical recipes. There are often no measurements listed. It's all about what feels right and what consistency you're going for. Once your ingredients are mixed, place it on parchment paper or wax paper in a pinch in the shape of a long line or sausage, wrapping the pea sausage tightly and securing both ends with a bit of string or a bread tie in our case. Make sure you place it in a cool, dry place to harden up and there you have it, Herbsverst. Allow the Herbsverst to sit for a few days to completely dry out and then you can cut off small slices to add to water and eat. But there's something else that you can do to make this recipe even better than it already is. Like we mentioned earlier, Herbsverst is not the only part of the iron ration. You can easily make some shelf-stable crackers to go along with it. So let's go ahead and whip up some hardtack. Now historically, various kinds of bread products and crackers were issued, and the historical record on this exact topic is a bit fuzzy on the different variants of these recipes. Most soldiers seem to have called these crackers Backsteinbrot, or brick bread, or Steinkracker, uh, stone crackers, or Zahnbrekerbrot, uh, teeth breaker bread, or even Bayonetbrot, uh, bayonet bread, because that was the tool that was needed to break it up for consumption. Officially, the bread ration was called Zwieback, or Nakebrot, or Heart Kicks, all of which have slightly different recipes. What we are trying to recreate today is Zwieback, which is the simplest and easiest to produce recipe. And that recipe could not be simpler. You take some flour, whatever random amount you want, and mix it with water until it forms a tough dough. 
You could add salt if you like, but other than that, keeping it simple is the strength of this recipe and what keeps it shelf stable. Once you have your dough, roll it out onto a baking sheet and using a pizza cutter or a cookie cutter, you can cut the dough into crackers. Historically, these crackers were very small, about one inch square in, in the terms of uh, Hartkeks or Zwieback. And this was done so that it's easier to bake, requiring less time and therefore less fuel. Also, smaller crackers are a bit easier to eat because you can just drop them in the soup when you make it. Once you've got your crackers cut out, pop them in the oven at 350 degrees until they are just starting to turn brown on the top. But be careful, these crackers are not like the bread you might be used to baking. They will not rise or change shape really at all, so it's easy to overcook them or burn them. So while we are waiting for our creation to solidify and for our crackers to finish baking, let's dive into a bit of the history of one of the world's first dehydrated combat rations. Invented in the late 1800s, Erbswurst has a quite a long history, especially in warfare. This meal was used frequently by the Central Powers, mostly Germany and Austria-Hungary, during the First World War, for many good reasons. It was extremely cheap to make, and since it was very resilient to adverse weather conditions, this was ideal for field kitchens which often had to work in adverse conditions. And if those field kitchens could not provide meals, such as during a period of heightened actions or a major offensive, issuing iron rations was a great way to provide a shelf-stable, calorie-dense meal to troops on the front lines when other means of nutrition could not be guaranteed. Fast forward to the Second World War, Erbswurst was a critical part of wartime nutrition. Germany, eager to not repeat the errors and starvation of the First World War, developed a new type of warfare, Bewegungskrieg, which is more commonly known by what the Western world calls Blitzkrieg. Bewegungskrieg, or a war of motion, was the major reason for Germany being able to expand so quickly throughout Europe, using new technologies such as the tank and combined arms warfare to expand their empire quickly, avoiding a repeat of the First World War which has become known for the stagnation of the trenches. And looking back at the events of the Great War provided a lot of things that worked and a lot of things that didn't work. And one thing that did work was the concept of the Iron Ration. The German Reich realized that a lightweight, calorie-dense, just-add-water combat ration would be perfect for supplying high-speed infantry deployments to locations or during offensive operations where field kitchens couldn't keep up. So even though it seems like a really simple recipe, back during the war, this recipe was at the cutting edge of military ration technology, at least in German military doctrine. Tinned foods such as canned meats were a major part of the nutrition of soldiers on the front lines, but canned meats are really only a part of the nutritional needs of a combat soldier. Like I mentioned earlier, Germany and Austria-Hungary suffered quite significantly from food shortages during the First World War, which is something that senior German leadership was eager to avoid during the Second Global Conflict. Hitler himself was extremely concerned about repeating history in this manner, and as a result, was extremely eager to implement policies to ensure that the German people did not go hungry, even at the expense of others. But that is another story for another time. For now, we have a modern day version of a century old recipe. Cutting edge nutritional technology that, at its inception, provided a very cheap, lightweight, and shelf stable way for soldiers in the field to easily meet their nutritional needs when on the move, or in times of hardship when their next meal might be days away. And in today's world, we can certainly make great use of this recipe, and others like it, for well, many reasons, but one reason that is specifically worth mentioning. Modern combat rations that are in service by militaries around the world today are highly refined products that are the result of years of testing and scientific analysis of the nutritional needs and desires of the combat soldier. However, when it comes to ensuring the longevity of such rations, particularly from the production side of the house, the absolute most important factor for militaries is the actual packaging of the ration. Things like retort packages and vacuum sealed freeze dried options are some of the best ways to ensure that food doesn't spoil before it reaches the soldier. The problem is that to make foods in durable thermostabilized pouches that will store for years, significant infrastructure is required that is not really practical in contingent situations. In other words, very few people have the ability to build MREs from the ground up in their basement. 
And while freeze-dried rations are certainly possible to make by average consumers, freeze-drying machines are still out of the price range of the overwhelming majority of people. But what most people can do is blend up some peas and fry some bacon. So even during contingent situations, older recipes like Erbswurst that seem a bit outdated certainly have great utility for people who have the needs for combat-style rations, but do not have the infrastructure or resources needed to emulate modern combat rations. So if you have these needs, give Erbsverse a try. Even if you don't like the taste, it's so cheap that it's worth checking out. But if you do like it, you can experiment with it and add your own recipes to create your own custom instant soup that will enable you to meet your nutritional needs even during a time of hardship.